Good afternoon, everybody. Um, what, one of the things I've really come to appreciate since moving down to London is what a fantastic and rigorous academic training environment um, it is in, on this rotation in between UCLH and HTD and the London School. H how many people in the room are, are either have done or are doing or are definitely going to do some formal research? Just so I can kind of get a feel for... So it's maybe a little over half, more than that, yeah. So I, th I think a, a lot of what I've got to say is not necessarily going to be any particular news to anybody. Um, and what Phil asked me to do was to you know, give a, a trainee's perspective. Uh, so I've been sitting thinking about you know, what, what perspective can I bring to, to, to what I've done. Um, and I think the best thing I can do is just to talk through the study that I've been involved with that's brought me to being in London today, um, and just to talk about some of the, the, the pra pragmatic logistical difficulties that we've met along the way. And, and then to, rather than going into lots of kind of data output from the study, um, to just kind of talk a little bit anecdotally about the experience and what I've learnt and perhaps how I've grown a little bit through doing that. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is, it's not infectious diseases, there's a slight tangential nod to infectious diseases, but it's actually a community-based epidemiological study of epilepsy that uh, we uh, did uh, in Kilimanjaro region in Tanzania um, over a few years. Uh, so this goes back to really to um, 2008 when all this started, and this has been going on since then. So to start off, uh, so I'm, I'm going to talk through the study a little bit and then touch on some issues of perspective and general thoughts. So, but just to start off, I'm just going to tell you the story of one of our patients and then use that as a kind of springboard to talk through the, the study um, and hopefully come out the other end with some kind of logical narrative. Um, so this, this is Elizabeth, um, who's one of our epilepsy study patients from Kilimanjaro. Um, not, pro not projecting very well, but... Uh, uh, Elizabeth was 21 years old when I first met her in early 2009. Um, we were doing a door-to-door -door, uh, population census-based screening study that uh, I'll describe briefly. Um, and when we first met Elizabeth, um, it was not longer after this had happened. So she had developed generalized convulsive epilepsy in her early teenage years, generalized tonic-clonic fits, loss of consciousness. And, uh, and she'd been taken by her family to see local doctors, and she'd been on and off uh, doses of phenobarbitone through her kind of adolescence and teenage years. Um, and at times, things have been reasonably well-controlled, other times less well-controlled, and a very patchy treatment history. And, uh, but she'd managed to finish primary school and get some secondary school education. She'd managed to get married. She had two young children, and she was living with her in-laws. Um, but in late 2008, um, she was not taking any treatment and uh, she had a, a, a big and prolonged fit and she fell into the open cooking hearth in the, in the, in the homestead where she was living um, and she sustained a severe burn to her leg. Um, and epilepsy is an extremely stigmatizing condition and this is partly why she wasn't being treated. Um, because there are a lot of concerns about keeping this very private and within the family and within the home. Um, so she sustained this injury. She wasn't taken to hospital. She was treated at home with kind of local topical preparations and so on. Um, and of course, the burn became infected and it got to the point where she was so unwell. And this is, you know, I was hearing about this after the fact, sounded like she, you know, she was really septic with a gangrenous leg. Uh, and she was taken to hospital and uh, she had a baloney amputation. And uh, because of family concerns and also because of costs and finance, she, she left hospital as soon as, as soon as she could after the operation. So she didn't go on to have any kind of post-op physio. Um, so when we first met her in 2009, she was living with her in-laws. She'd lost her leg and she had a fixed flexion contracture um, at this knee, which meant that she couldn't have a prosthesis fitted, um, which is even more upsetting really when you consider that the local hospital where she'd had her operation was Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center and as part of the compound set up there there's something called TATCOT which is the East African Center for Excellence for training for prosthetic uh, manufacturing uh, technicians and, 
and it's actually quite possible to have prostheses measured and made for very cheaply or, or for free there um, with a bit of negotiation, um, but that was denied her. And um, so we started on treatment with phenobarbitone, which is the most easily available drug locally. It's a very, very old-fashioned drug. It's got a bad name for various reasons, but it's very effective as a broad-spectrum anticonvulsant. Uh, and she got complete seizure control um, very quickly, within a few weeks. Um, but when we went back to follow her up uh, a couple of months later, we found that she was no longer with her in-laws. She'd been sent home to live with her parents because the family had decided that enough was enough. All this hospital, losing the leg, fits in the household, and then foreign doctors coming around and making a fuss. And uh, uh, So she was back home with her parents. Her in-laws had kept her children, uh, and she was living behind closed doors with her parents at the age of 21. And the cost of phenobarbitone at a maintenance dose of about 120 milligrams for somebody like Elizabeth is about between five and six dollars a year. So, you know, having said this is an academic environment, that's a very emotive anecdotal story. But I think right at the beginning, Elizabeth taught me a lot about what I was going to learn from doing this community-based study about the reality of living with this chronic but treatable condition um, in this population. So we'll maybe come back to Elizabeth a little bit. So just to, to give a little bit of background, um, very briefly, I won't bore you with all these figures, but uh, epilepsy is a huge problem. So in sub-Saharan Africa, the incidence is probably double what it is in Europe, but it's very difficult to get good, reliable, robust data to make these estimates because we don't have things like uh, GP practice registries, medical records. Um, so a, a lot of this data comes from demographic surveillance sites, which are few and far between, or from very limited, very biased series. Um, prevalence, probably also double what it is in Europe, um, and very wide ranges of estimates from sub-Saharan Africa, 8 to 33.2 per thousand in the latest uh, systematic review and meta-analysis. Uh, and that figure hasn't really shifted, this median figure hasn't really shifted over the past 20 years or so. And a global pre prevalence in Africa of uh, approaching 10 per thousand. So even though that represents a huge number of people, it's way below the kind of two, so one and a half, two percent prevalence kind of figure that really starts to interest policymakers and funders for diseases of you know, major public health importance. Um, so this really is a neglected tropical disease in that sense. Um, and there's a significant mortality associated with epilepsy. So you live in the UK and you have epilepsy, your standardized mortality ratio is three. In China, it's approaching four. In Kenya, it's approaching seven. And from this, this is a large treatment cohort from China. If you actually look at the data by age group, it's the, the burden here really is on the young adult population of kind of productive, economically productive, reproductive age. They're really disproportionately burd burdened with very high mortality rates. But the prognosis is good. So regardless of which drug you have access to or drugs, Three quarters of people can expect to have good control of the seizures um, within a couple of years of being on consistent, adequate treatment. And most of the countries around the world carry these WHO essential drug listed uh, drugs, which are cheap and widely available. And certainly phenobarbital and phenotoin and carbamazepine are all, in theory, available in Tanzania at a district or a village level. Uh, Valproate is, is not readily available um, uh, outside of private centers or referral hospitals in Tanzania. Um, but the treatment gap is enormous, um, well over 80% in most low-income countries and estimates from, from Africa really, this is essentially an untreated condition um, and we'll try and illustrate that a little bit from our population. So I got involved um, in uh, a community-based study um, which was based in a demographic surveillance site uh, in Kilimanjaro region and this had been set up in the 1990s and 2000s as part of this thing called the Adult Morbidity and Mortality Project, which is a, a huge DFID Tanzanian Ministry for Health funded project that set up three surveillance sites to collect prospective data on various health and uh, social indices with really a focus, focus on non-communicable disease, not exclusively. Um, and uh, Professor Richard Walker, who's based up in the northeast of England, uh, has kept this site in Kilimanjaro going on a shoestring over the past 15, 20 years or so, uh, and has built up quite a, a, a kind of a, a roster of uh, NCD disease cohorts um, that are being followed up prospectively, and, and this was where I came in with establishing this epilepsy cohort. Um, this is just Tanzania, Kilimanjaro regions up in the northeast of Tanzania, and High is just one of the districts there. 
Um, so the, the infrastructure you've got for doing research in a demographic surveillance site will look something like this, where you'll have a main researcher, um, often based overseas, uh, and then locally you need some kind of uh, immediate research base. And, and the way the high setup works at the moment is that uh, a research nurse will be recruited uh, to work alongside a visiting UK research registrar, and then there's a team of field workers based in the district. Uh, there's four clinically trained uh, clinical officers or assistant medical officers, um, but they supervise a large number of what we call enumerators. And these are, there's at least one enumerator for each village. And these are people that are really embedded in communities and work door to door and are very skilled and experienced in collecting um, standardized questionnaires and you know, maintaining trust and access and so on. So getting involved in this, you find yourself parachuted in to actually being in a fairly managerial role of a very large team with a lot of logistical problems. And I think this is probably the, the biggest thing that I've taken away from, from getting involved in this, is that this is experience way beyond what I ever would have been exposed to as a junior registrar working in the UK, um, which is really you know, a fantastic thing to get the chance to do. So just coming back to this, um, what I realized was this is all very well on paper, but uh, we have to find our research nurse, um, and uh, that's not easy, but we managed to recruit. This is Jane, who works at Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center, and this is Leocardia, who uh, was a nurse who worked with our Tanzanian PI in Dar es Salaam in the neurology clinic there. So with a lot of goodwill, um, we managed to raise some money, and we brought them over for a month to the UK, and we put them through a kind of hastily uh, arranged epilepsy training program with the help of neurologists, neurophysiologists, community epilepsy nursing services, so on and so forth, as part of a kind of preamble to me going out to work alongside them in the study. Um, and this is just illustrating some of the field teams. So these three chaps here and these two guys here, these are our clinically trained supervisors that uh, are kind of responsible for some of the field supervision. And then there's about 40 odd people stood in the background here. There's 65 village enumerators in total, and these are the people that really make it possible. And this is the real kind of privilege and pleasure of doing this kind of community-based work, is that uh, you really are working alongside people in the community and uh, learning a huge amount as you go along. How did we pay for this? Well, uh, this pig is a nod to neurocystosicosis, which is what paid for the study. So uh, one of our research questions was, how much does neurocystosicosis contribute to the burden of acquired epilepsy in this population? Uh, where there's a fair amount of circumstantial evidence from Africa, but there hadn't been any sort of good community-based, prevalent cohort-based studies using serology and neuroimaging alongside each other. So uh, we put in a, a proposal to BMA Charities, or I did rather, and, uh, and that was funded. And we, we stretched a small amount of funding a long, long way to, to employ our team over a number of years and to collect a huge amount of data while delivering uh, the actual research question that we said we would, uh, and we have managed to do that. Um, so just, I'll, I won't go through this in huge detail, but this is a, a typical two-stage study where we ran a census. So this is a population of 161,000 people, 47,000 houses. Each one was visited, questions asked by the enumerators, uh, and then Jane and myself set about uh, interviewing and examining all of the positive responders uh, to make diagnoses of epilepsy or otherwise. We then collected controls and compared these uh, with uh, cases in terms of uh, historical risk factors and investigation findings. So a bit of uh, holiday pictures, very beautiful place to work. So this is the kind of uplands of Kilimanjaro, very lush, very fertile, small holding. Um, uh, Kilimanjaro there, kind of a daily, daily site on your, your way to and from work. Um, lower down in the kind of uh, the, the midlands as you come down off the slopes of the mountain, very, very fertile volcanic soils and a couple of times a year kind of burst into life with you know, fantastically green maize crops. But as soon as you come down off any alt kind of altitude, you're into uh, semi-arid uh, lowlands which are populated more by um, semi-nomadic pastoralist people, so the, the Maasai, the Wameru, uh, a couple of other different tribes. Uh, and these present very, very different challenges in terms of actually tracking down people in these very disparate, geographically disparate communities. Um, and really requires a lot of painstaking work working alongside village elders and village chiefs and so on. Um, so we traipsed around about 150,000, 1,500, sorry, 1,500 square kilometers uh, of the district. Um, you can't see our, our trusty jeep here very well, um, but going to dispensaries where we'd interview patients, um, sometimes quite nice with furniture. Other times you'd have to actually borrow furniture from a neighboring house and really kind of brings it home 
how difficult it is for local health teams to actually offer chronic disease management um, type paradigms where this is the kind of infrastructure that you have to work in. So being motivated to actually go to work, motivated to go and see the doctor or the nurse uh, when you've got this kind of very cold, stark environment to work in. Uh, and often no local facilities really, so there's just an improvised clinic going on under a tree, which obviously brings into uh, bring to bear all sorts of issues of confidentiality and so on. Um, and, but this is what it's really all about for me, which is really getting into people's homes and going door to door, uh, interviewing and examining people in private. So here's this a patient here in the shadows, uh, Jane here interpreting. So, so we, we, we did something like 1,200 interviews, Jane and I myself, um, going round like this over the space of about 10 months of intensive work and then various trips back over the following couple of years. So, so what I mean by you know, real shoe leather epidemiology, it's uh, very painstaking, exhausting work, but very rewarding. Uh, and what we come out with is uh, some prevalence estimates. So all of these people that we identified um, in what we have <coughs> described as a low prevalence area for epilepsy, but all of these people are people with generalized, quite severe convulsive epilepsies. So we really didn't manage to pick up more su subtle focal motor type seizures, absence type seizures. Um, and what we have a strong feeling for is there's a lot of stigma and a lot of hiding of cases. So there's almost certainly under-reporting and under ascertainment here. Um, but fitting with this pattern, there's very high burden uh, in younger age groups. The, 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 the prevalence curve through the lifespan from UK or US would look a bit like that and then go up again in later life with, with vascular disease. And there just aren't enough um, people living that long enough uh, in this population as yet for us to see that if it's there. Although in our neuroimaging, we did, we did see a lot of vascular um, disease changes uh, in older subjects that had CT scans. Um, most people had been for help, but uh, less than 60% of people were under any kind of follow-up when we did the study. Um, and of those, again, just over half reported taking some kind of treatment. Um, and uh, about a fifth of people, we couldn't work out what they were taking. Um, and of all these people taking treatment, um, only just over 10% of those people were seizure-free. So if you contrast that to the 75% good prognosis that you should have, it really, you really start to get a feel for the treatment gap. Why, why can't we tell what people are taking? Well, this is the kind of thing that you find. So <coughs> just, just some disintegrated tablets in an unmarked bag. This is medical supplies department. This is the, the, the government uh, medical supplies. But again, uh, no, no record of this and very poorly kept records in the health centers. Um, you can't see this, but this is an ephedrine tub which contained the, the dispensary supply of phenobarbitone alongside the ephedrine tablets in the same tub. Uh, and often you just find people producing kind of improvised containers with unmarked tablets that just bought privately in the marketplace. So very, very difficult to say what people are using. Um, this chap uh, lived um, within a mile of a local dispensary that was well stocked and had a very good uh, uh, local health worker who knew a bit about epilepsy. He'd been self-scarifying to control his seizures and was not on any treatment. Um, I'll maybe skip over some of the data because it's, it's, it's well, no. So we, you know, part, part of our epidemiological task was to, to kind of work out if we could find any, any predictive factors that would be in some way informative of interventions. And we found that uh, factors associated with ever having pre presented for treatment, if you drank alcohol, you were less likely to. But uh, if you had some kind of education, then you probably, you, you, you know, you're nearly two and a half, three times more likely um, to go for treatment. And if you had some kind of awareness, and obviously that's nothing that we can intervene with. And again, if you use traditional healers, you are less likely to have gone for treatment. For staying under follow-up, again, if you've been given some kind of diagnosis that mentioned epilepsy, then you are more likely to stay under follow-up. And if you had any education, you were more likely to stay under follow-up. So I'm going to mention those again at the end. Um, but this was a very actively uncontrolled group. So by the time you get to counting 70% of people cumulatively, these people are having seizures most months. And these are very, you know, the severe end of the spectrum. So it's very active. And about a quarter of our patients had burns of some degree that had been um, acquired directly during seizures. Uh, this woman, uh, this had happened to her just a few days before we first saw her. Um, this poor chap ran a kiosk that sold cigarettes and batteries and biscuits and that kind of thing. Uh, and people had stopped coming. He'd, he'd knocked over a primus stove with hot... Um, stove fuel and it had fused his fingers um, and he could no longer handle money in small change um, so his business was was going to the wall really. We managed to 
um, sort a few people out with a local orthopedics program that did a, 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 a contractual release and rehabilitation program. So uh, we, we raised a bit of charitable money to, to help some of these people. As a clinician, um, lots of interest. So here's neurofibromatosis, uh, Sturge-Weber syndrome, uh, tuberous sclerosis, um, some uncharacterized uh, syndromic um, problem. This chap had epilepsy. He's got uh, some kind of cranial synostosis. He's got uh, uh, cranial nerve palsies. Uh, he's got a, a cystic swelling here, and all of his digits are fused. He apparently was in, appeared to be intellectually intact. He had children, uh, and his CT head scan was normal, other than the odd appearances of his, uh, of his uh, skull bones. Um, so a lot of interest. And, uh, in terms of going around, and, and a lot of these people you're seeing have, have never really presented um, in a syndromic way and, and, and have understood that these things that are slightly odd about them are actually part of a pattern uh, and that it makes sense and, uh, uh, and, and often un, 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 untreated or undertreated. Um, but what we really kind of learnt was the social side of things, so people excluded from school, from work, from marriage, a lot of sexual harassment uh, for young women with epilepsy, a lot of very strongly held beliefs. Um, and again, we've tried to see if we can model this a little bit. So in terms of social factors, uh, much more likely to be uh, divorced or separated if you have epilepsy. Um, and again, much less likely to have completed your primary education. And these hold true when you adjust for other um, confounders like cognitive and motor impairments and other physical disabilities aside from the epilepsy. Um, so just to come back to infectious diseases, uh, I'm sorry to say we found very little neurocystis psychosis. We looked very hard. Uh, we did serology, two different uh, antigen ELISAs, uh, and a big uh, neuroimaging. And it counts for 1.1% of the acquired epilepsy in this population. But it's an important negative because a lot of the kind of editorial literature around parasitology in Africa is kind of pushing for neurocystis psychosis as a, an emergent public health problem. I'm sure it is. Uh, and, and perhaps that's a ref reflected in higher prevalence areas. And there are a lot of interesting questions about pig husbandry and the kind of ecological environment that uh, would be worth studying. So to, to, to wrap all that up, um, epilepsy is very treatable, but access to treatment is very limited. But that seems to be associated with underdiagnosis. So there's an intervention, and we, we, we've already started organizing um, training workshops for local healthcare workers about giving confidence in actually making this diagnosis and understanding this is a condition that you can manage in the community. Lower educational level seems to be associated and one of the follow-up studies we're doing is with kids and looking at correlating stigma scores uh, and uh, knowledge and attitudes about access to education both amongst patients and ideally amongst teachers as well. Um, and high rates of focal onset epilepsy so I've got an agreement uh, from somebody over at the CDC to do some extended Luminex-based serology looking at other parasitic causes, but I think it will be a bit of a, a fishing exercise, really. But uh, I think that it is worth looking because this has been demonstrated from multi-site studies elsewhere in Africa. So I'm, I'm gonna, that, that's all I'm going to say about the study. And in the last couple of minutes, I'm just going to, to, to provide, to, uh, you know, to, 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 to meet Phil's request of, of uh, you know, perspectives. So, so... This is uh, the integrated uh, academic training path recommended by NIHR, where you go through medical school, foundation programs, and then um, usually at the time or just after getting your training number, um, if you show research potential, then you can go into something like an ACF post, 75% um, time still clinical, and work up and then go out into uh, a funded uh, research training fellowship and do your MD or your PhD. And then if that goes well, come back into a clinical lecturer post, which could be for up to four years um, with a view to going on into senior lectureship. Um, and if anybody is, hasn't done this yet but is thinking about doing research, I would strongly, strongly, strongly urge you to, <laughs> to really get into a structured program if you can. This is my route through research. So PRHO jobs, general professional training as an SHO, and then some sort of vaguely formed ideas about working abroad, so I went and did the DTMNH in Liverpool. I think there's a couple of class of 2006 people in the audience uh, today. Um, and uh, I was actually thinking of going to Tanzania to do some work uh, around uh, diabetes in Dar es Salaam um, with a couple of contacts uh, that I'd made. But this was the time of modernizing medical careers and MTAS and 
anyone that I went to for advice said, you must stay in the country now, you'd be mad to go now, you'll be completely out of the loop, you'll never get back in. So I found myself back in Newcastle doing a locum post. In the first time I'd done any ID, um, I thought, doing the DTMNH, thought, hey, this is great, infectious diseases, I hadn't thought about this before. Um, uh, I absolutely loved my ID job, um, but again, it, this was the time of run-through programs, and there weren't any immediate job prospects coming up um, uh, that were immediately attractive, but at this time I bumped into my future supervisor, who I kind of vaguely knew before, and uh, he said, what are you doing next year, Ewan? I'm thinking of doing epilepsy next. Uh, and the answer at that point was, uh, well, I'm not quite sure what I'm doing. So, uh, so that led to writing a proposal which was funded for a teaching and research fellowship, um, which was done over three years, uh, and then I had to win funding for the, for the post, go and do the field work. Uh, lots of things went wrong with the field work. The database wasn't entered. Um, I won't bore you with the details, but uh, basically I found myself back in clinical training with a, a, a training number that I applied for and got after going into this research job uh, and then writing up my PhD basically in, in, uh, in my spare time uh, while working as an ID and general medicine registrar in the Northeast uh, through to about halfway through ST6 when the conversation that Phil told you about happened um, and I was given the chance to come down here and finish my training at the London School in HTD which has been fantastic. It's given me a chance to finish off some of this epilepsy work and start to work up some future directions with where to go with this um, uh, and obviously the great experience at HDD. So perspectives, um, for anyone who hasn't done any community-based research, the clinical experience is amazing, the managerial experience is phenomenal and uh, the, the, the skills that you'll learn and develop are absolutely invaluable um, and uh, uh, the, 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 the amount of collaborative work you have to do to actually get a functional research infrastructure up off the ground, to, to, especially if you're looking at things on a shoestring at neglected conditions that people aren't kind of really working at on in uh, big organized groups uh, is a lot, a, lot, a lot of work. But considerations, and this is the kind of honest part, um, uh, get some research training. So I, I went into this with no research training and basically learned it on the job. And by that, I mean learned it while I was doing my field work. And, uh, kind of reading about bias and confounding and teaching myself how to do logistic regression, how to use SPSS and so on uh, while out in Tanzania. So, um, you know, and I don't, I don't think that you can kind of talk about that uh, in a good humoured way, but I, I, I think the, the research suffers from that and your <laughs> clinical work probably suffers from it as well. So, you know, you're juggling many, many balls. Uh, think about support and funding. So, you know, I, I would never cast any aspersions on the people I work with, but uh, I think with hindsight I see that uh, it really wasn't a particularly structured environment to go into and you're working very much in isolation and that can be very, very difficult. And ethically I think when you establish cohorts of patients you do have a duty of care and this isn't something you can just walk away from easily and you think you, know, you may well end up with hundreds of people that you feel in some way obliged to look after um, in the years. Uh, ahead and think about how that's going to integrate with your clinical career and your training aspirations and, and, and there aren't necessarily easy answers but something to be aware of and also on a personal level think about timing this is a disaster uh, when you're trying to do research these aren't all mine um, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, this is George is my oldest um, and the message here is, uh, he's looking very proud here, but he hasn't built this himself. And, 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 and I think one of the things that I've really come away with is what a fantastic experience is to learn how to get along with and work with people from all sorts of backgrounds, whether it's cultural, professional, different disciplines, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and it's the only way you can really achieve anything. Um, and just to, to show that slide again. So just to finish off, another anecdote, yeah, another uh, little anecdote. So this is our patient here. Um, so this, I forget her name, but this, this girl was, uh, I think she was 16 or 17. This is her mum. These are her siblings. So, the, so again, I saw her very, very early on in the study and her mum had carried her on her back about three kilometers um, to get to the clinic where we were seeing patients. And um, the story was that she, I don't know if you can see, she's got a slightly dysmorphic appearance, but this is a, a girl with quite profound learning disability. Um, but when she's well from a seizure point of view, she can walk, uh, she's continent, she can express her wishes, she can feed herself. 
Um, but when she's having lots of seizures every day, she becomes essentially bed-bound and completely dependent on care. Um, and with stigma and embarrassment and concern for her daughter and so on, uh, the mum hadn't been out of the house for quite a few weeks at the point that she came to the clinic and she'd heard that uh, we were seeing people. Um, and uh, the kids were not going to school because they were being teased and bullied by other kids. Um, and the family had uh, stopped going to market. This is a barrow where people take maize and tomatoes and things down to the market, uh, sacks of coffee, coffee beans and so on, um, because uh, people had stopped buying from their stall because of epilepsy being in the household. So they were kind of retreating into the home. Um, and when we followed them up, again, we got very good seizure control very easily, uh, and the patient was ambulant. The kids were back at school. They were on their way home from market. Uh, and in, in the woman's, in the, in the mum's hand, this is our handheld seizure diary. So we devised a, a simple tally system to record the number of fits. And on the back, there was a flow chart in Swahili for the local health workers about how to titrate doses, when to call for help, and some phone numbers for the research team um, uh, to, to, to call if there were specific clinical issues that they felt they couldn't deal with in the community. Um, so, so this is utilising the local clinic, the local health worker and drugs that are in stock and just putting in a bit of education for the patients, making the diagnosis, educating the local health worker uh, and actually, you know, I believe, achieving quite a, a dramatic result. Um, and you, know, you, you could reproduce this story many, many, many times over in just one study like this. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you.